Today we will have a discussion on how to co-produce or sell your movies in the US and Canada and what are the challenges of such an endeavor. The advice and insider tricks will be shared by three experts from the USA. We have Mr. Peter Van Steenberg, Director of Acquisitions at Magnolia Pictures, and two fellow Canadians, Mr. Stephen Hoban, producer of such movies as Splice and Ginger Snaps, and Mr. Ari Lantos, executive producer of the TV series Men in Brooms and the movie Stage Fright. Is Ari here? No, he's not. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, okay. I'll, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves uh, later. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now, uh, though the Canadian film industry is often referred to as Hollywood North, it is not merely a branch plant for Hollywood productions. Toronto, Ontario, and Vancouver, BC are the key players in the North American film industry right after Los Angeles and New York. And actually, we were just talking about how popular Ottawa has become as a, as a film production centre. Canadian films are shown at all international festivals and receive their fair share of Oscar and César César nominations. This success is a testament to the hard work that goes into creating, promoting, and distributing television shows and films. As Canada emerges from the global economic recession, it is important that uh, the Canadian government supports those industries that will continue to grow and provide jobs well into the future. And film and television production is one of these key industries. The volume of all film and television production in Canada increased by 8.9% to an all-time high of $5.49 billion in 2010-2011, with approximately 128,000 individuals employed on a full-time basis, including 50,000 uh, jobs directly in film and television production, it is not a small industry. Many Canadian films are made in cooperation with other countries. We currently have co-production agreements with 53 countries, and this includes Estonia and Latvia. These agreements permit Canadian and foreign producers to combine their creative, technical and financial resources to co-produce films and television programs which benefit from national status in each co-producer's country. Over the past decade, Canada has co-produced over 800 projects, um, including such successful feature films as Barney's Version, which was Canada-Italy, Incendie, which was Canada-France, Resident Evil, Afterlife, Canada-Germany, and a number of television productions such as Franklin, which was Canada-France, and The Tudors, which was Canada-Ireland. I hope that these discussions will inspire and encourage you to work more closely with the North American film industry and that we will see Estonian co-production projects with the USA and Canada in the near future. I know that there's a, a lot of creativity in Estonia and, uh, and expertise and uh, there should be good opportunities for cooperation. In closing, I'd like to thank the organizers of the Talon Black Knights Film Festival and the Estonian Film Cluster for giving us the this unique opportunity to learn more about accessing the American, North American film industry. Thank you. My name is uh, Colin Brown, um, and um, despite the accent, um, uh, I'll be moderating the panel on, uh, on accessing the North American market. And uh, yes, I, I'm British, but I spent um, more than uh, half my life in New York, one of the, uh, the, the capitals of the North American independent, one of the capital cities of the North American independent filmmaking scene. Um, most of that time, I was uh, editor in chief of uh, an international movie magazine called, a uh, business paper called Screen International, um, which is a European title. I happened to edit it from New York, which tells you a lot about. Uh, the, the way the world uh, seamlessly integrates, especially in the world of film. Um, and during that time, um, you know, I, I was immersed in the, the North American independent filmmaking scene, um, both in New York and also through attending festivals and markets uh, in LA, the American film market, and Sundance Film Festival and the Toronto Film Festival, um, and some of the other festivals, South by Southwest and so on. And during all those years, I was always struck by a few things about the independent movement. No matter what people said about the state of it, um, when, during bad times, films still got made. And when people were complaining how, or when, and when people said it was good, 
independent producers still complained how hard it was. And I think both those things are true. This is an amazingly resilient part of the, the film industry, and one that is always, in some sense, struggling, or not maybe struggling, but just having, you know, fighting. Um, and that's part of what makes it independent. Um, the other thing I've learned that no matter what, horror films always survive. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, no matter, um, we, the press keep writing about, you know, that it's overkill, it's, you know, to, you know, to use a phrase, but uh, it, and it, that it's uh, there's a glut of material. And then, sure enough, it sort of resurfaces, it mutates, other subgenres emerge, and the audience gets excited. And I mention that to, only because, um, as luck would have it, the panel we have today, one of the common links between them, other than the fact that they're either American or Canadian, is that they've all worked in one way, form or another on films that have had a horror element. And I think, um, you know, I think it's great to have a panel where genre is properly represented because uh, you know, it's, a, it's a very serious business um, and you know, I think very uh, appropriate for, for, for this audience. But before I start, actually, let, let me get the sense of who you all are. Um, how many are Estonian? Hands up. Uh, how many from other Nordic countries? Okay, and how many, what's left? <laughs> okay, and, and ha um, other parts of Europe then, okay? I'm guessing, yeah. And uh, how many are producers? Okay, all right. Um, what I'm going to do now is, uh, now, now that we have that sense, um, I'm going to get the panel now to introduce themselves. Um, uh, we'll go down the panel, and then I'll follow up with, um, with questions, and then you know, we'll, we'll leave plenty of time at the end uh, for, for questions from, from, from the audience. So, uh, um, Travis, can you tell, tell me a bit about yourself? And, and uh, yeah. First, uh, thank you, Sten, for inviting us, and you know it's been a lovely uh, festival so far. So, thank you guys for coming out as well. Uh, my name is Travis Stevens. I run a um, uh, independent production company called Snowfort Pictures, and we sort of focus on elevated genre films that were covered a bit yesterday at, uh, at Todd's other panel. Uh, it's basically, you know action, horror, sci-fi movies with a, you know, a, a marketable hook and um, talented directors and, and cast to sort of make them uh, appealing to, a, to an audience wider than the budget. Um, and so uh, launched that company in 2010 and we've made 10 films so far and gearing up to do another four this year and then I'll probably retire <laughs> or cry. <laughs> Uh, Todd, and, and I should point out, uh, we have a last-minute substitution uh, instead of Ari Lantos. We, we have Todd Brown. Uh, Todd, can you tell us about yeah. what you do? Uh, my name is Todd Brown. Um, I, I guess for the purposes of this panel, I do a few things. Uh, I'm a partner at XYZ Films. I am based in Toronto myself, so I'm Canadian. Uh, the rest of my business partners are in Los Angeles, uh, and we work both as producers and as a sales agency. Um, so we're making our own films, selling our own films, but also selling films by other North American producers and a lot of international producers, both within North America and internationally. Uh, succinct. I'm Steve Hoban. I have a production company based in Toronto called Copper Entertainment. Uh, we started uh, many years ago initially the idea was to make a horror film and make a family film because back then those were the two kinds of movies you could make without movie stars and have a chance at getting international distribution and that was the goal. Uh, right after we decided to do that, Hollywood started making lots of horror movies and lots of family films with movie stars. So the, our idea to get into the industry and get into the international business uh, quickly and easily didn't happen. It's been a struggle right from the very beginning all the way through. Um, I've produced movies that were made for under $2 million up to $30 million. 
And it's just as hard for me to finance a movie that's a $2 million movie today or a $30 million movie. Nothing has changed, as Colin says. It's, uh, it's hard today. It was always hard. Um, but in a way, it's also relatively simple. There just really aren't that many moving parts to put something together. So we've concentrated mostly on genre films. And that's because if you're not in the Hollywood system and you're making English language films, which is what I do, you, that's almost all you can do and have a chance to get it internationally distributed. Uh, and then the one sideline we have is animation. And we've continued to make short animation. Uh, a film we made five or six years ago called Ryan won an Oscar. And so we've continued to do animation just more as a passion than as a business. And that's me. Yeah, Peter. Um, my name is Peter Ben Steinberg, director of acquisitions at Magnolia Pictures. Uh, we're a U.S. distributor. We're part of a series of companies owned by um, the billionaire Mark Cuban, who's a very well-known kind of presence in the U.S. Owns some sports teams, but he owns this um, series of companies, including the Landmark Cinemas chain, uh, a production company called Twenty Nine Twenty Nine, and the film distribution label Magnolia Pictures and Magnet Releasing, which is like our genre brands, but same team of people. Um, we do about 40 films a year, and we're one of those c rare breeds of distributors now, which is uh, really a pure acquisition company. Um, we do not generate a lot of our own content. Every once in a while, we'll maybe co-produce or, or pre-buy something, but we are one of those companies that actively goes to markets, both domestically and internationally, looking for completed films mostly, and we kind of compete in the open market. We're known in the U.S. primarily for documentary, U.S. indies, and elevated genre in addition to, um, you know, art house international cinema. So we do a little bit of everything. Uh, it's only about 40 films a year, though, so we, we really have to scout and we really try to create a diverse slate of films. There, there are two sides to this discussion, I think, um, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at both. Um, one is accessing the North American market directly, which is getting films into that marketplace, uh, your films, um, and there's also collaborating with the North American marketplace uh, through production, so either uh, co-producing or co-financing or, or even um, um, act serving as a location for, you know, uh, North American um, films. Um, I want to start with the second first, just to get, give you an overview of the North American marketplace. Um, um, and, then, and then we'll backtrack in, in, into, into co-producing. Um, and so, Peter, if I could stay with you. Um, give, us, give us a sense of, you know, as, as someone who acquires heavily, and, and uh, but just give us a sense of really, the, you know, what the appetite is for kinds of films, particularly international, uh, in North America. And also, to, to us, I mean, I think what you're doing now with VOD and ultra VOD is, is really interesting. And, points the way forward, I think, for, for a wider menu of, of films being released and finding your audience. No, I'm glad you pointed that out. One of the things that we're known for, and because we own a variety of companies, uh, are, is a hybrid release strategy. Uh, a lot of U.S. distributors, really of any sort, are limited, um, uh, certainly theatrically, by a, a particular sort of uh, like windowing of release. Uh, the theaters fight really hard to kind of keep their window. Uh, the traditional way of releasing a film as it, it, it's remained in most of the world is theatrical, you know, DVD, and then it goes on to VOD and other digital platforms. What we've been able to do, because we have our own DVD label and our own theater chain, uh, is take a film and look at it um, as its own entity completely. So you take a film and instead of putting it through your system, you're able to craft a system around a, a film. It, it works primarily for us, we've noticed, with English language films. Uh, foreign language films in the US still have more of a traditional uh, platform release that works. And I think that's because that that crowd is still a theatrical going crowd and a bit of an older crowd. But the more that we do it, and one of our biggest films, uh, most successful films was 13 Assassins. This was a day and date release essentially where we released it on VOD prior to a theatrical release. So what we're doing is we're putting all of our P&A spend and all of our publicity into the theatrical, but it's been playing on VOD for the same price point for two to three weeks prior to that, and it's getting adverti free advertisement, essentially free to us, from the major service providers like Time Warner or Comcast. 
This is something that I know a lot of other countries, a lot of other distributors would like to mimic, and it, it, it becomes difficult when you don't have it sort of wrapped up like that. But for us, it, it allows us to do a, a variety of films, both domestically and internationally, because we can craft a strategy around something. So you're not looking at a film and, and knowing that you're going to take a hit on one particular platform. You can actually toy with the dates and how you release it. Um, in, in terms of looking at the international market, I think that unfortunately the numbers are, are against producers and independent producers internationally when it comes to the domestic market. We look at, just to give you an idea, a little over 2,000 films a year and we distribute 40. About 30% of those are going to be U.S. documentaries. Uh, another 30% is probably going to be uh, like U.S. independent films, which leaves a really small margin for doing the rest of the world. Um, I think it's uh, fortuitous that many people on this panel do genre, and I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, I would never suggest to a filmmaker to just like go out and make a horror film if that's the first film they make, but they, they do stand out in the market, particularly to someone like us, because you can take a chance on a new filmmaker. Uh, its concept and execution is first and foremost when it comes to a genre film. And I think that that can help a filmmaker, particularly when I'm out scouting, even if you didn't make a genre film, to be able to look at that thing that makes you unique as a, as a filmmaker and push that first and foremost. When we're looking at that assortment of films and that array um, and that huge amount, uh, you really only get one shot. Um, and so we look at gatekeepers out there in the field, whether it's festival programmers or sales agents, to help kind of dictate that. And I know we can get into that, but I'll pass it off. Yeah. Um, Stephen, um, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of, of, of your film Splice, but um, I wonder if you could, we could sort of move the conversation now a little onto, into, onto co-production and use that, sorry, and, and use that to talk a little bit about um, um, distribution. North American distribution for some films is, is one thing. So for, for, for studio films, it's the same company releasing. But I think for most of the films we're going to be talking about today, it's often a, a, a hybrid strat. So a distributor in, in the US buying rights and then a Canadian and sometimes two Canadian for French speaking and, 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 and US. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit now about co-producing um, as a Canadian producer um, with foreign partners and how that plays into the distribution um, in Canada and elsewhere. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Sure. So, well, I'll back up to the beginning of Splice because that was a, a co-production film that we made uh, four years ago. And uh, it was always intended to be a co-production because it was written by a Canadian and was going to be directed by a Canadian. But it was a relatively expensive movie. It couldn't be made in the normal contained Canadian system. So the only way to make that film was to bring on international partners. It didn't necessarily need to be a, a treaty co-production. And we've done a number of films that we, we see as co-productions, but they aren't official treaty co-productions. And it's really just our partners or international partners. Splice happen to be a treaty co-production. So it's that, that traditional model that, that people talk about often. And it worked very well for that film. The goal, though, for the film it was an English language genre film that was made for over $26 million. So in order for that movie to work, it had to play in the US market. If it didn't, it was almost impossible that it could be financially successful. So even though the US market was our primary target, we didn't finance it out of the US. We, uh, we did it as a co-production with France. Our co-producing partner was a company called Goma which is a, uh, one of the very big distribution companies there and also finance companies. And at that time, when we first started speaking with them about five years ago, they were interested in doing the same thing that probably a number of people here are interested in doing, getting into the North American market. It's a market they didn't have. They, uh, at that time, had spent many years, even though they're the oldest film company in the world, for the previous couple of decades, they'd really just made French comedies and thrillers, which don't travel internationally very well. So they had targeted, as I had targeted, the US market not because that was the ultimate goal, but the U.S. market meant the world market. That's, that 
is the way to have a film that can make sales all over the world. So they had the same goal that we had, and uh, we had a couple of choices. We could have tried to raise the money with the studio, but it was really not a traditional Hollywood movie. And again, it's probably going to be the case for lots of people here. It was a genre film, so it had some hooks and some things that made it a, a relatively commercial movie, but it just wasn't the kind of movie that a studio would say, here's all the money. So we did it the traditional hard way. We went around internationally, talked to a number of different people, and ultimately found this French company that had the same goals that we did at the same time. And uh, financed about two thirds of it from France and another third from Canada. And again, it was the traditional thing. They put up risk money as a sales company and they put an advance against France. We had a Canadian distributor that put E1 that put up money for Canada. We had um, the traditional tax credits that we have in Canada and we had a little bit of equity from an organization called Telephone Canada. So that was how we structured the financing. Once we had the financing, it became all about cast, as it always does for the U.S. market. It's, uh, again, genre's the only thing where occasionally cast doesn't matter as much, but when the budget's a bigger budget, then it does matter. Um, we ended up at that time casting it with uh, an actor named Adrian Brody, American, and a Canadian actress, Sarah Pauly. And neither of them really big stars, but they both had cachet internationally as quality actors. And, and oddly, we found that Sarah Pauly, uh, it's, you'll find unique things when you start to package a film. In certain international territories, she meant quite a bit more than Adrian Brody, Adrian Brody did, which was a very big surprise to us. Um, and at that point, Brody was coming off of King Kong, so he was about at as high as he got, and he immediately, his, his, uh, his marquee dropped like a stone right after that. So, uh, so we probably are the last people that paid him so much money. Um, but what it did do is, at that point, once we'd cast it, we still didn't have any U.S. distribution, but we then had interest in the U.S. So the director, a guy named Vincenzo Natale, who has a lot of credibility in the genre world and in many international territories, uh, but not so much in the Hollywood system, he and I went to the studios and, and pitched the project. It was a very unique kind of film, and, and he's a very unique filmmaker uh, with this particular aesthetic. So the studios got that, and they saw it as a substantial film because of the budget and the cast. At the end of the day, they all passed. It was, uh, again, it was a little more aggressive than a standard Hollywood movie would be, but there was a lot of interest. Uh, and we almost did a deal with two studios, ultimately decided not to. Um, well, they decided not to. And, uh, <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> one, one of them threatened to sue us after that as well. So it's, uh, it's, uh, they thought our designs were too similar to a small movie called Avatar. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so we ended up going ahead to make that film without any U.S. distribution, which, frankly, is the way I've done it for every single movie except for a couple of films that were sequels to a, a first film that I did. And that is still the case today, even though ultimately for Splice, Warner Brothers ended up picking up and it got quite a big release in the US. And that really helped the, a lot of the international territories, including Canada. Canada got a huge boost and the film was the most successful Canadian movie that year, mainly because of Warner Brothers' release. I don't think it would have had that success at home if it weren't for the US. And it really helped to drive a lot of the international sales. So, but despite that, still, the movies that we put together today, we cannot, unless we have a really big director or a big star, you just can't get, I can't get the studios interested up front. So what our strategy has now become, it's uh, still mostly genre, although not exclusively, it's been to package the films internationally. So get talent that would work for international territories so that we can actually make the movie. And then once we, once we finance it and cast it, then go back to U.S. distributors, and they're not always the studios. There's, uh, there's four or five theatrical level distributors. Well, one of the things that's developing that Peter had talked about is the uh, video on demand market in the U.S. And that's also affecting our strategy. And I think for international financiers looking to get into the, uh, or producers and financiers to get into the North American market, that's a really key thing. And so I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But that's, that's what we're doing now. We basically package, finance, cast, and then we start looking at the U.S. market. Just if I, can, if I can say something just yeah, sure, sure. distribution model, like from a sales company perspective, mm. um, as Steve and Peter have both 
been talking about VOD, um, and you mentioned how it's possible to do multiple deals in the territory. Um, that's not just a U.S. Canadian thing. Um, one thing we do as a sales company is you really look at how you maximize revenue stream. Um, with a company like Magnolia, it's pretty easy because they directly output their own DVD. They directly control their own VOD platform. There are very few companies that do that <laughs> um, on the independent level, and you, it's something you have to be very, very aware of as a producer. Um, because if you sell to certain people and they don't have, say, their own DVD releasing mechanism, it means that they're sub-licensing. And there are companies that you would look at and say, oh, that's a big brand, that can't be an issue there. It's an issue there. Um, and it means they put out the movie, you're losing like 30% off the top that's going to the distribution company, that's just cost against the release. Then it goes to the distributor. They take their costs for their P&A. That's probably another 20 or 30 percent. And then they start calculating what's going to be your percentage going back to the producer. Um, so you start stacking on producer. You start stacking on those service fees, mm -hmm. and your bottom line shrinks dramatically, very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and we did the the North American sales on this Australian documentary um, called Machete Maidens Unleashed. And on that one, we split. Uh, it's, it's a great movie. Um, it's about the, the exploitation films made in the Philippines uh, in the 1970s um, and a little bit into the 1980s. But when we did that deal, we realized there were certain distributors that we really liked that would be very, very good um, at different things. Mm -hmm. Um, but none of them had everything in one place. And so in that case, what we ended up doing is we busted it into pieces. Even and in the same territories? Oh, yeah. We, yeah. Uh, we separated out the, the VOD in the U.S. to one company who was very good and had their own platform. We were fortunate to find a DVD distributor um, who was open to uh, collaborating with somebody else and letting those rights go somewhere else because they knew that's not where they were really going to make any of their own money anyway. Um, and then busted out both of the Canadian territories. Um, we did like five different deals within North America on that one film. But c can you be that sort of granular in, I don't know, minor, smaller territories in Europe? I mean, does it pay to be that, you know, to isolate the VOD in the uh, It's, that's a harder question to answer just because the VOD is not as developed in yeah. other places. But you could see that happening? Right? Uh, yeah, I could see it going that way. Um, and within North America, though, it's definitely something you really need mm -hmm. to be aware of because there are entire heat tiers of hidden costs to releasing. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I'm sure you know as a producer, and like, like something like Splice, I mean, as you're waiting through P&A deals and how are people going to do their accounting and what's going to be considered a cost against the film, what's not going to be a cost against the film, it has a huge impact at the end of the day. And we always, as a sales company, when we're talking to producers, we're always telling them it's not about the MG. It's not about the advance. Um, I mean, it is to a degree, but you can be blinded by that. Where somebody comes down and says a number up front, um, there's a if you choose the wrong company, that's the only number you're ever going yep. to see, ever. Um, just because of the way the back end is structured, you're never, nothing's ever going to come back to you after that because it's all going to go into different servicing fees. If uh, a European producer, you know, was going to collaborate, you know, with, with uh, an American entity, they'll have to come, they'll be coming across this all the time. Now, what, what, what is that? And, and what are the value, you know, how, t go through the process and, sure. you know, the um, when, when, a, when a project comes in to a sales agent, um, it would be great in, in a perfect world. All that would matter with, was whether it was a good script and a talented director. It's, this is not that world. Um, we, have, we have definitely learned the hard way um, that loving a project is not enough to sell it. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, it, uh, yeah, a good pro a project being good is not enough to sell it. Um, when the buyers are buying, um, and this is why genre works as well as it does, when buyers are buying something, fundamentally the first question in buying isn't, is it good? The question is, is it sellable? Uh, because at that level, um, I mean, and there are exceptions, and I know, I mean, we've sold things to Peter that were passion things. Um, I, there, there, are, there are exceptions to this, um, but you can't, you can't plan based on being an exception. Um, when, you, when you get to distribution, you're a good. 
Um, you, you are a consumer good and what matters is what the audience is and what they're willing to spend. Um, and so the typical thing is you look, sit down and you say, okay, what's the genre? Who are the cast members that are in it? Who's the director? Then you basically sit down and you create a grid of comparable films. And you say, okay, what business did those movies do in these territories? And you break it down, and that becomes your range. And that's your package. Um, your package is your genre, your, your cast, your director. Um, and you, you can allow for a certain amount of variance within that, but nobody's going to pay more for your movie than what the last five movies of that type averaged. It'll just never, ever happen. Um, which is why, as producers, you got to be very cautious about what areas you're moving into. Because, and as a sales company, we have to be cautious about what things we take on. Because um, there are certain projects that are great, but people just don't buy them. Um, so, give, give an example. Let's. There's there's a whole, um, you know, spate of found footage movies yes. right now. Um, it's what? a dangerous territory to get into. How do you package found footage? Uh, well, found footage uh, is one that kind of breaks the rules a little bit because when you're packaging, us as producers, it's, you, you evaluate slightly differently whether you're producing or selling. Um, as producers, what my partners are very, very big on doing, it's my partners Nate and Nick who do most of the, the, the financial structuring. We like to reverse engineer where we have a project, we have an idea, and we'll, we'll do the comps ahead of time and say, when we're done, if this movie turns out to be just kind of OK, like if it doesn't really hit it um, and it's just all right, this is what we can count on. Um, like you, you plan your budget out based on it not working mm -hmm. um, or, or the movie not turning out. And, and we work out that number, and that's our budget. Um, and then you hope that the movie turns out really well, and then you're into a situation where you can sell it for more, and, and it's profitable. And so that, in that case, it's just based on the concept, because you know, yeah, based on script no, and and, and who, who, the, perhaps, who yeah. the filmmaker is, and we'll run models based on different levels of casting yep. um, to try to figure out, you know, if we cast this way, it's going to probably sell for around this value. Um, but is bringing that cast member on actually going to generate enough of an increase for them to be worth it? Okay. Uh, Travis, this would be a good point, I think, for, for, for you to enter the discussion because, I mean, obviously you, you bridge, the, you were, you know, you, you, you involved with Celluloid uh, Nightmares, which is an XYZ and Celluloid Dreams uh, venture company, but now, now you're a, a producer and, and have worked with some of the, 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 the Adam Wingard and some of the, uh, the filmmakers in that genre. How do you, what's your perspective on this as, as now as a producer in terms of uh, um, approaching the films that you, uh, you work on? Yeah, I, I think uh, the smartest thing any producer could do, independent producer could do, is learn as much about the sales and distribution game as possible because uh, making a movie in a vacuum is the biggest mistake you could do. You know, you want to know that there's uh, an appetite for that type of film. You want to know that you're, you know, as Todd's touched on, that you've cast the right uh, type of actors in there. And, you know, all the way to the marketing. You just want to be aware of what the space um, is looking for. And that's going to, you know, make your chances for success uh, that much easier. Rather than, oh, I'm just going to go make this movie because I think it would be brilliant. Maybe it will be. Maybe it won't be, you know. Um, so, for me, uh, you know, I spent uh, five years in the in the foreign sales game, and that's uh, you know, besides just opening up relationships and, and learning distributors from around the world, you sort of you you get a sense of of how to sort of navigate that space and find projects that that will work in as many territories as possible. Um, so we did a we're doing a science fiction documentary. Uh, on Alejandro Jodorowsky's attempt to make Dune, so you know we've got uh, you know the, the, the <laughs> you know, uh, Latin American component for him, and he now lives in France. So there's the French component, and H.R. Uh, Giger is a part of it. So there's this uh, you know uh, uh, German component. It's, you know, it's sort of we were able to bring in a bunch of partners around the world that you know normally a documentary might not be able to, be able to do. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I, I think that's basically the most important thing is just sort of talking with people before you commit to making a film and, and just getting the feedback from the marketplace on if it's, uh, you know, what the sort of potential for the project would be. I'm, I, was, I was looking at your, um, your the credits and it came across, I mean, the, 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 the film that you did, the Thompsons with, with um, Lionsgate in the UK. Now, you'd read the, that was a sequel of sorts or a follow-up to a previous film, uh, that, the Hamilton. It could it have shot anywhere. Um, yeah, could you have, could you have picked? And, I mean, yeah, what's no, the that's thinking? That's a perfect example. Like that that movie uh, would not. We would not have made it if it weren't for the UK. So basically, the first movie was a tiny vampire movie called The Hamiltons, and in the UK alone, it grossed like a million dollars on, on DVD. And it was the most successful terror. I mean, it made more in the UK than the rest of the world combined. Um, so when we decided to make a sequel, it was, OK, what can we do to increase our chances of success for the second one? If that's our biggest territory, let's set the, set the story there. Um, and then it becomes a matter of sort of finding the right partners on the ground to, to, to help facilitate that. But like that's a perfect example of, of it wasn't just about making uh, a sequel. It was about doing, doing the research and sort of analyzing the numbers to, to do what you can to ensure its success. All this being said, it came out, I think, three weeks ago and totally bombed, so <laughs> it's irrelevant. But you know, at least we had a plan going in. <laughs> I mean, just this as an exercise now, because I, I sort of want to bring it back to this audience. Let's, let's imagine it was a big hit. Um, and you, they decide now, you're, you're looking at the third film, and um, they decide it's going to be set in a place that's perpetually dark, let's say, for five hours around this time of year. So you start looking at this part of the world. So it's going to be the Butcher Brothers, the, the filmmakers. Um, the third one is now going to be set in Estonia, perhaps, or Finland, or and somewhere. So what's the thinking that goes behind? What, how would you evaluate that? Well, I think. You know, we, we were sort of talking about this yesterday. I mean, you have to sort of look at the the space and and see what what would end up in the movie from there. So so here you'd look at the landscape and locations and and the sort of the the vibe, and you'd say, okay, what can we do to really to really capture this and, and present some unique uh, you know some of the unique attributes on screen, and then you design your story around that. Uh, that would be one thing on the creative side, and then, uh, you know, the equally important is just sort of finding the right partners on the ground. So that I mean, because the the scariest thing about doing an international co-production is is risk, you know, and you just never know. Like the movie we did in the UK, I mean, we were on set, and like for the third day in a row, our meals were pieces of bread and butter, and I was wondering. You that's know, what, that's what we eat. That's what we survive. <laughs> yeah, that's we were a little surprised. You know, we had these orphans working on, on the film crew, but um, <laughs> but no, you, you want to go in feeling confident that that when you're actually going about making the movie, you're going to have the resources, and everybody's been up front, and they're going to be there throughout the whole process. Um, so I think both of those things, and it, it's funny because. The sales agent really wants us to do a third movie, and they really want it to be in this part of the world. And we just need a, probably six more months of vacation before we would consider it. Um, I'm going to go back down the panel. I'm, um, and anyone can now jump in. I, um, I did some research that uh, 329 horror movies were released in North America, has been released between 1995 and 2011, so 329. Um, that seems low. Yeah. yeah that, that seems low. And, well, that's just theatrical. So, you know, exactly. and, um, just theatrical. Uh, so add in all the others that, you know. Um, and the company I now worked at did some research and, and looked at films uh, budgeted, horror films budgeted between 100,000 and 15 million with in this case, for, for various reasons, looked at ones that just had equity finance in them, and found that the return on investment on those between 1995 and 2011 was, was 140%. So, you know, done correctly can be really good business. Yeah. Um, but done correctly. So I, I wondered, let's, let's talk a little bit about 
the horror genre particularly because um, I, you know, I know that, I mean, that's a huge category because in the end it can cover almost every other genre you, you can be combined. What are, what are the pitfalls and, and what are the, you know, the, uh, of going to that and how do you, you know, how do you keep it fresh? And, and I, I, anyone can jump in here, but from both a distribution point of view, a co you, well, yeah, for, so it will work with audiences, you know. Um, I mean, I think the benefit of... Uh, in other words, avoiding glut. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, I think, I think the benefit of genre and the reason that it appeals and the reason that it can work without cast in, in the right circumstances um, is that genre film ultimately is about ideas. Like, the pitch is not go see the new Brad Pitt movie, it's you go see the, the new Haunted House movie, you go see, you know, it's, it's about the idea fundamentally, and that gives you some more freedom. Um, and it's also something that's continuously reinventing. Um, the problem comes when something hits, and you, you brought up the found footage thing earlier, um, and I don't think I ever actually fully answered that question, but the reason found footage uh, kind of messes with the rules about packaging is because they're so cheap to make. Yeah. Um, so you don't need to worry about the return so much. Your risk is so low. Um, the difficulty with something like that, though, is something happens, uh, paranormal happens. Um, you know, in the art house world, it's like when Dogma 95 happened. Um, and for very similar reasons in the economics, there was like the sudden moment where everybody who had a video camera suddenly went, hey, I'm a filmmaker. Um, and it's supposed to look crappy, so you can't criticize me for it being crappy. Um, and then there's this massive wave of it. And suddenly it's, I mean, the idea is not an interesting idea anymore because everybody's already seen it. And I can say as a sales agent, as a festival guy, um, you go through the submission pile, there's, 30 or 40 at least horrible found footage movies that cross the desk every year. Every yeah. <laughs> oh, um, for, re for real. Yeah. One a week. One a week. Yeah. Um, and the overwhelming majority of them will never be seen by anybody. Right. Um, people keep doing it because they look at paranormal and it seems like every year there's one that hits and you get this incredible return. Um, if you can find a new way into it, it still works, and it's a cinematic language, I think, that you can do interesting things with, but there's an enormous hump to get over with found footage right now, just like a couple of years ago, and still to a degree right now, if you were making a zombie movie, you really better have had a really interesting new way into it, because the basic zombie thing was really played out. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea has to win, and if it's an idea that people have seen, you know, four or five times in the last three or four years, it's not an idea anymore. Just leave it alone. But you look for that thing that makes it unique, and I, I actually think that this um, can, can, can cross genres, but when you're looking at films internationally, we, we always say that there's like a, a funny line. You want a film, like if you're, let's say you're looking at found footage, you know you're gonna tap in to an international, uh, you know, portion of filmmaking that, that has a measure of success, certainly in North America. But on the flip side, you also want that thing that makes it uniquely, um, you know, Spanish or Estonian or where, wherever you're kind of coming from. I think that there's, there should always be for filmmakers a real focus on telling personal stories and regional stories. I mean, it, it really does start with the film. It starts with a, a, a level of quality. You, ha you can't just, um, sell a, a mediocre film because it falls into a particular genre. And so when I look for found footage, or when I'm looking at, at genre content in particular, that's the thing that I want to see. If it's a vampire film, like what, what's, what's your spin on it? What's that personal take? Like what's the, the Romanian take on the vampire? What's the uh, you know, South African take on the vampire? Uh, and I think the genre, like you said, because it's, it's really about concept and it's about ideas, really allows for filmmakers to play with that. But there are ways too in, in, in any genre to, to look at it in that way. You have to know what makes it universal. At the same time, you hope that it comes from an authentic place. And I think first and foremost, when I'm looking at a film, that that's, that's what I care about the most, um, because that's how I'm gonna that's how I'm gonna sell it to the North American audience and make it feel special. I'm gonna say that this is a new voice from a particular area, and I'm, I get to bring you there and show you a, a, a unique vision. So to play that line, I think is the hardest thing for filmmakers, and it's the hardest thing for a distributor or a sales agent to kind of tap into is what makes it universal and also what makes it um, is specific and, and authentic. Now. Give VHS as an example. I mean, it was bought from Sundance at the festival. 
we're at a festival now. I mean, I'm, I'm taking it that actually that's a great, that's possibly one of, that that's, could be a, a, a differentiator, right? I mean, the, the, the way that audiences react or not? Festivals in general are hugely important mm -hmm. when you're at, at my level. And I know this is different than what they'll speak about because by the time it comes to me, it's already gone through these gatekeepers. It's already passed Steven's desk or Travis' desk and certainly Todd's desk. Um, we have to look, we have to find a way to navigate through all of these films. And I think that one of the mistakes that a filmmaker can make is, is just seeing someone get excited about their film and signing on, whether that's a festival premiere or whether that's a sales agent. I think it's really important to look at have there been films that have sold out of this festival? Where have they sold? What distributors are attending? And certainly when looking at a sales agent, what have they sold to North America? I mean, this is not hidden information, and I, I really don't think people do it, do it enough. But for festivals, we absolutely look at how it's played before, because I need to find some way of, of uh, you know, creating a, a, a hierarchy just on my desk in terms of what we're going to look at. And if I know that it's played at Sundance, and I know that, like, that those programmers have responded and that audience has responded. That's, that's tangible information. I mean, that's something that we can, we can absolutely use to gauge what the response is going to be in North America. And the fact that somebody fainted, apparently, in that, that screen, did that help? Love it. <laughs> Love it. I'm, I'm on the festival thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's not just any festival. Yeah. Um, right. there, there are certain festivals that are, that are the tastemakers um, for, a, for a number of reasons. One, because of clarity of, of kind of vision of the programmer. I believe good programming is very curatorial. You should be able to tell the personality of the programmer from the program. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain audiences um, in some places that are very critical and very selective and very representative of how things will work in the marketplace. And there are other audiences that love everything. And you, Toronto. Uh, <laughs> no, I, actually, I'm, uh, I will say this. Uh, Colin Sear, um, the Midnight Madness program in Toronto has been the marquee place for genre film basically for as long as Colin's been running it uh, in terms of films that are going to make a break in the market. It is better by far than the Midnight Programming in Cannes, which will every year typically, I think, have one or two really good films and then a bunch of films that are chosen for political reasons. It is better by far than the Midnight Programming at Venice, which is programmed by people who don't give a damn or understand genre film at all. Um, and so they'll have the occasional thing that's good, just kind of by the law of averages. And they'll have a lot of stuff that isn't. Yeah. Um, the, but all the smart buyers in Toronto know um, there are the press and industry screenings, which are convenient time-wise. Mm -hmm. um, and there are the midnight screenings, which are with the audience. Yeah. The smart buyers go to the midnight screenings with the audience, always. <laughs> And what about, I mean, the fancy festivals is one of the big fast rising things around the world. I mean, are, how would you rank some of the ones overseas, the, the fantasy ones? Sick, Citrus? And, um, um, Citrus and is, and is fantastic, uh, is very, very good, um, been very important for a long time. Uh, Brussels is the other really big one. Um, uh, but there are a bunch that are good. Uh, as a general rule, P P Fan and Asia. Yeah, P Fan is very good. Um, the simple rule for me as a programmer and. Um, as I've been involved, like it's, I live in both worlds, um, and the programming world is really small, especially this particular pond. There's, you know, there's 15 or 20 of us that are controlling the large majority of these festivals, and we all know each other, and we all mostly like each other. Um, for me, for Europe, there's there's an there's a, an accrediting body, the European Federation of Fantastic Film Festivals, that all but two of the majors, I think, right now are a part of. Um, and I mean, even PFAN, which you mentioned in Korea, is an associate member. Uh, Fantastic Fest in the U.S. is a member. Fantasia in Montreal is a member. Um, you hit those festivals. Uh, Hapsalu, uh Hoff has just joined. Um, those festivals have a circuit, and and more than just. While well, some of them are in smaller centers where you're not going to get a ton of press, the big benefit to the, the EFFF is um, they have an award system within it that is cumulative. Oh, okay. um, so every award gives the Silver Melier Award, which qualifies you for the Gold Melier Award, which is given at Citrus at the end of the year. Um, and and if you've that, won that, it means... Does, I was going to say, does that have commercial currency I mean, in terms of... Yeah. 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 I mean, because here's, here's what it is on the, on the independent 
level, and especially for genre, so much of it is about establishing the title and getting as much sort of uh, awareness of it as possible. So even if, um, you know, there might not be a lot of press uh, attending a genre festival in, in a small town in, in Portugal, the lineup will be covered by the big genre websites. And once again, it's another place for if your film's in there, the name gets out there. And then by the time the, the distributors are looking at it or by the time it's hitting uh, the retailer shelves, hopefully it's all translated into, oh, I remember that. I'm going to check it out. I'll shell out my whatever, 10 bucks for it. So I mean, it's something, again, that before you even shoot the movie, you should consider, you know, what is my festival strategy going to be for this film if I shoot it? in the summer, where am I going to premiere it, mm -hmm. you know? And maybe you look at pushing uh, one direction or the other to, to, to have it coincide with a, with a good festival launch, because yeah. it's only going to make everything. Well, and I can say as press and as somebody, I mean, I'm scouting for a lot of stuff, but b long before I was involved in kind of the production sales side of things, like just purely as press and, and running my website covering international film, um, there were certain festivals that you watch because that's where it's like, where is the local stuff going to show up in Spain? You know, um, kind of a big part of the game for me is figuring out where the emerging markets are. Mm -hmm. um, and it's how do you find the voices that are in those markets? You watch the local festivals where they've got smart programmers and you see those people out on the circuit. And every time one of those announcements comes out, it's like that's the rest of my day is sitting down with Google and Google Translate and chasing <laughs> down as many titles as I can and looking for images and looking for footage and trying to see what looks interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to open up in the floor just after one question. And, and Steve, I wanted to ask you this. Um, it came up in conversation yesterday. Um, t t there, there's been a shift in, in thinking on budgets and I, I, wonder what, um, I wonder if you could talk about a little bit. You know, if, I suppose it's good news in general. Uh, I, th I think this room is that, that budgets are going down, which means that, in, in a sense, that filmmaking is becoming within the reach of more and more people, um, and perhaps less star-driven. I'm not sure about that. But I mean, if if you were going to make a film like Splice today, you probably wouldn't do it on the same with the same thinking, right? Uh, it, when we made it, we didn't want to do it for that budget either. Right. It was just at the time with the visual effects, it couldn't be made for less, but it right. really should have been made for fifteen million dollars. Yeah. And it's it's kind of like the the grid that Todd talked about, you know, figuring out what's something likely to make. And I mean, there's lots of factors. Like, mm. and if you're doing a lower budget genre film, usually it's the concept, and then it can start to be the director or cast. It's a, if you have Jason Statham in your movie, it's a 10 or 12 million dollar movie. That's what it is. Yeah. It's a, there's certain things, and if it's a certain director, if it's Michael Winterbottom, that's a certain budget right there. If you don't have any of those things, then it's the genre, and then it's pretty much what Todd said. I've never been as smart as Todd is, so I've never done it the right way. <laughs> I would always raise the most amount of money I could possibly raise and put it all on the screen, and that's really not a smart strategy, and I'm surprised I'm still in business. Because <laughs> I'm not doing that as much anymore, because uh, Splice, frankly, could have been very, very successful for everybody yeah, if we could have concept. made it for less. I mean, it's a genetic engineer, right? It's a great concept. It could, yeah. Presumably, you, you could have reimagined that in endless... Well, not with that apart director. Apart from the special effect. <laughs> oh. Not with that director. So it's, uh, it really was about pushing the bounds technically. Right. So it, it had to be more expensive than it should. But we just, in fact, with that same director, just uh, made a movie for $5 million a few months ago. Yeah. And it's a haunted house movie. It's a very cool concept. But really, that movie should have been made for $3 million. That's what the market... That's a exactly what Todd's guys would have come up with. They would come up with three million bucks, maybe three and a half. We made it for five. And it's partially because of the way that director works. Now, because it's that director, we were able to raise a little more, but it makes me nervous. Because my, my biggest concern, I think every producer's biggest concern after making the best movie you can make has to be returning the investment to your financiers. That's, that's always my biggest concern. Much more than me making any money, because if I can't pay my investors back, I'm not going to have a future. So I'm, all, I'm very concerned about the grid that Todd talked about. We mm -hmm. just finished a $15 million movie. And I'm terrified <laughs> for my uh, financiers. It's a, they just did some sales at AFM, and it looks like it's going to be fine. But yeah. it's, uh, so it, it, I don't know if budgets are going up and down. It's, uh, I'm trying to be more responsible with pushing the budgets down. But there's a point where if you push it down too far, there's no point making the movie. And if you always aim for the downside, mm. 
then you're never going to, the yeah. chance of getting up there. So, you know, one of the first films I produced was a movie called Ginger Snaps. We were able to make that years ago in Canada with a lot of Canadian financing, as well as some international financing. And we made it for more than uh, most Canadian films were being made for at that time. It was a little under $5 million. But it allowed us to make it a certain way. And then Lionsgate gave us $12 million to do a sequel and a prequel. And if we hadn't spent that much money and put it all on the screen, if we'd said, okay, you know what, this kind of film should be three million, I don't think there would have been a sequel and a prequel. And uh, so it's, it's a real balance, and it's partially path of least resistance. And that's what producing is often about. It's uh, like Travis said, you know, for the sequel he was just talking about, the UK, that was the path of least resistance to get a movie made. Yeah. Um, so it's, there's so many factors. Um, I'm, I'm going to open it up to, to questions. Does anyone, uh, could you put your hand up and introduce yourself? Yeah. Yes, yes over there. Yeah. I have a question for Travis. Um, I just noticed in the beginning you said that you set up your company in 2010 and you have already made 10 movies within that short time. Um, how do you find your projects or how do you develop them? Or do you develop them at all? Or, and how do you finance them? A lot of questions, but you Still know, for sure, out. for sure, you have like a good system. Um, well, for me, uh, I basically all the movies I make are based on wanting to make a movie with a person, and we'll find the concept one way or the other. So I don't read a lot of blind scripts that come in or, or whatever. I hang out at festivals and I drink beer and have food with people and. When you find somebody that you get along with and, and you really connect with, then it's very easy to, to figure out how to work together because you're going to be um, married to the person for three years. You know, you should like them a little bit. So, because um, I'd been in sales for a number of years, there were uh, a number of filmmakers that I had relationships with, had acquired their films, you know, uh, brought them out into the world, and it was very easy to sort of set up the first uh, batch and. Uh, we just went one after another because it, it's such excitement and it was, uh, you know, I think like Stephen said, it's once you figure it out, it's not that complicated to replicate it as long as you're, you're going about it smartly and, and, you're, and you're giving each film the attention and the due diligence and you're not taking wild risks. Um, so yeah, so for me, I, I, I drink beer. That's how I pick my projects. <laughs> and them because it's a very short time span that you're speaking about. Um, it's a it's a mix between um, my money, uh, the money of some private investors, uh, money from a sales agent as an advance, or or in certain cases pre buys from companies like uh, Peters, and you just sort of piece it together and you you make the movies for the price that it makes sense to make the movie at, if that, if that makes sense. If, uh, if I want to make a movie for a million dollars and I can only get 500,000 in sales from it, maybe I'll make the movie for 500 or you know, wait <laughs> until somebody else sees, sees the, why it should be a million. But. Nick holds a thumb from Variety, so colleague of yours, Colin. Um, I mean, apropos of this question just now, I mean, one of the big differences between indie filmmaking in North America and here is the system here is very much skewed towards getting finance from soft sources. You know, all those government commissions, you know, film funds. Um, so, you know, perhaps it's speedier where you are because you're not having to deal through that, but in a way it's maybe a bit easier in Europe. So I'm interested to know how you can take films that are made here with soft finance and marry them perhaps to, to your system to, to put some speed into the system. Do, do you think that that's a possibility? Um, we're, we're doing one right now, um, which it's kind of the origins of the project are similar to what Travis was, was just talking about. It's a director who I saw a short film that he did as his thesis film about three years ago. Um, and then I made a point of nagging him every two to three months, uh, sending him an email asking him why he wasn't making a feature yet, um, until he wrote me back and said, I've got a script. And I read the script, and it was great. Um, so it was a project that started with this relationship. But uh, the director is, is German. He's based in Köln. And 
it's a type of movie they don't really make in Germany. Um, you know, it's Germany likes to fund certain things, and so they knew that there are certain. He had a very very good producer uh, locally. Um, it's the German producers are, are Rat Pack, who are like you know they're a really well established, really good company. Um, but they knew in terms of applying to the bigger funds uh, and and some of the larger system, there was no point because the the kind of the gatekeepers on those systems weren't going to fund this kind of movie. So they knew, you know, there, there are certain things that are automatic. There are certain credits they can get. There are the the kind of the post production supports and that that sort of stuff that they knew was going to be there, and that got us a certain way uh, uh, automatically. And then we sat down, and I mean, this whole process started. Less than six months ago, I would say. Um, and so we sat down and figured out, well, what, how do we do the rest of it? And there were two basic options, uh, and we're kind of doing a hybrid of both of them. And one was, you know, does it make sense to co-produce in different territories? And so we sat down and we, we drew up a list of who are one or two producers in a number of different territories who we like, who we think would click with this material, and we sent it around. Steve was one of them. Um, just to get people to read it and get their feedback to see what they thought, like how it would play, if it fit into their schedule, if it's something they thought made financial sense. Um, we ended up with a producer in France who was like, this actually could really work and here's some ideas of what I could do and how we could help with the post and, and, and a system that would work. So that brought us another chunk, um, again, without having to wait for the big long process. Uh, and then we took the project to market uh, at AFM uh, based off of a promo reel that we had the director shoot. He's uh, got a very, very strong uh, visual effects background. Um, so Benny went in, he did a one day shoot, spent two weeks on post, did everything himself. Um, and off of that promo, without even having cast attached yet, we pre-sold a third of the budget. Uh, and we're shooting in the spring. Um, and there's, there's a fighting chance we're doing this movie without any equity at all. Yeah, I mean, I think, not to jump in, but I mean, what, a lot of what we're talking about is designing movies for the international market. And that's almost in conflict with uh, a movie that might qualify for a local film fund. You know, what we want to do is we want to find movies that are going to work in as many territories as possible. And if that's what you're doing, the, the interest from the distributors uh, you'll be able to get it much quicker than doing the application process for, for whatever co-production treaties. It's like, I can't imagine waiting a year to find out if somebody is going to support my film enough to make it. It's like I could go and have, you know, enough meetings in one month to get it set up and I'd be in production and be, it'd be released by the time I, I get that application back, you know. So I would encourage, I know and this is spoken to somebody who hasn't had to go through it, and obviously Stephen works in, in the Canadian system and probably has a different perspective on it, but I would, I would just encourage looking at, at the production of movies more as the sort of the business side to it and, and just analyzing, you know, who your audience is going to be, who the distributors are that are servicing that audience, what they're paying for the movies, what you should make the movie for, and, and go that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add to that, that it really depends who you are, where you're at in your career, and what the project is. And it's, you've got to do whatever you can do to get it together. And if that means it takes a year and a half, then that's what it does. And if it takes three months, it's, I think it's never, ever about rushing it. It's, uh, I think it's whatever resources you have. And like Todd said, I think what they did with that project was very smart. They figured out what resources they could count on for sure, and that becomes your cornerstone. And then you can go out and you can say, well, we've already got 25% or we've got 40% or whatever you have. You have to start with something. If you've got just a script and no cast and nothing that's particularly distinguishing and no money, you're never going to get any interest. It doesn't matter what you have. So you have to start with something. So in that case, they start with a little bit of money. And that's what I do. And, I, and Travis is right. In Canada, it's different. We have, we have the system, but I only use the system for about 30 or 40 percent of the films that I do, because if I did, it would be that. We'd be waiting forever. And there's a limited amount of resources. So what I do do is I take the Canadian tax credits, which are similar to what they have all over the world nowadays, and I just assume I have that. So I always start with a film by saying to all distributors, I've already got X amount of the money. And then, and anybody, almost anywhere in the world can do that because it's true. 
It's uh, if you're if you have a budget, you already have 20 percent or 25 percent, assuming you get the rest of it. And so, not waiting a year and a half sometimes is the right thing to do, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes you should wait and just get whatever you can because the it's the biggest risk money. That's what you need to somehow figure out how to get. Can you just very briefly tell us about the Canadian uh, tax credit system? Sure. It's, uh, it's, it's either the oldest or certainly one of the oldest tax credit systems in the world. And uh, there's the federal one that applies to all films that shoot anywhere in Canada. And then each of the provinces in Canada have different systems. And some of them are grants. Most of them are tax credits as well. And, uh, and they, they're designed to work together. So you can be a foreign producer and come to Canada and get tax credits, or you can be a domestic producer and get slightly higher tax credits, but only slightly. It's, it's almost as beneficial to be Latvian or American as it is to be Canadian. I, I don't even refer to the Canadian tax credits as Canadian anymore. To me, they're the American tax credits because they're really designed to bring American producers into Canada. But that applies to everybody in the world. And, and I, I see Canada as the perfect bridge to the North American market. I think if, if anybody anywhere in the world wants to be making films for the North American market, they should absolutely be considering Canada. It's, uh, we have, uh, as the ambassador said, we have more co-production treaties than any other country in the world. There are 53 of them. So anybody just about can make a movie that is a Canadian content film and then can take advantage of tax credits. And sometimes there's an organization called Telefilm Canada, which again is a federal body. Uh, it's got limited amount of money to many countries in the world. It sounds like a lot of money, but it's so oversubscribed that uh, you know you can sometimes get $3 million from them, but there's a lot of people competing for it. But if you do a co-production, you can potentially get that on top of the fairly generous tax credits. So uh, it's, it's a very flexible system. It's the most bankable one in the world. Uh, banks in Canada and all over the world will bank the Canadian tax credits and give you 90% up front. And in a nutshell, that's what it is. Has anyone on this panel had experience working with the, um, the soft money in America, uh, the United States, the, the, the different state uh, production incentives? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I think all over the world, it's, um, you know, once the recession hit, it's becoming a longer, slower process. Uh, it gets shaky in, in the states. It, each, the states that have the, the tax credit uh, have slight variations, and, and, you know, there's been a number of cases where people have set up a production in a particular uh, region, and by the time they finish the production, the state has changed its uh, law and no longer will honor the, the tax credits. Um, it's a little, yeah, it's a little uh, nerve-wracking. But, uh, I mean, we did a movie uh, in one state, and it took... 16 months to get the tax credit back. And I mean, the good thing is by the time the money came in, we were so hungry, we really appreciated it. <laughs> so, I mean, there's that. It's like waiting for Christmas as a kid. <laughs> when you are building your strategy for uh, distribution and selling the film, uh, do you consider the UK as a, on a strategy level, as a part of North America or Europe? And um, when uh, you look at Europe, do you think of a distributing in Europe in order to get um, money back or as a test market for the North America? So basically, I sell in Europe and I see how it goes there so that I can get more financing or more, um, let's say, more views in the North America and then get distributed also there. And um, um, speaking about taxation, I'm from Italy, so let's say bureaucracy is a big, big, big problem we have, and uh, uh, legislation is not really um, cinema friendly. Uh, so, uh, which countries in um, in Europe do you think are more uh, cinema friendly for investing and for co-productions? Thank you. Um, I'll take the how Europe is viewed as a market, like from the sales perspective. Like there's two different, uh, there were two different questions in there. One in terms of distribution, um, I don't. The indies certainly don't use Europe as a test. Um, you've seen a couple of times in the last year. Um, 
three or four, uh, where the studios are actually switching the release strategies. And there's been a couple of very, a few very high profile films that have released in Europe first. I think it's happened for different reasons. Um, Skyfall and Tintin released in Europe first because uh, they just have larger built-in fan base. Um, Tintin, definitely, they wanted the international success to help the marketing within America. Skyfall was going to release and do well anyway. Um, but it's just, it's a British thing, so it didn't hurt. Why not make a big event of it? Um, Battleship released in Europe first because everybody knew it was horrible. Um, and they wanted to get the money out of Europe before it failed in America, and it poisoned the rest of the market. Um, <laughs> For the record, I love that film. <laughs> um, so that's on the distribution side, that's, that's what that is. Um, uh, on the sales side, uh, the way the market basically works when you're, when you're tallying things out, there's America, which is kind of its own thing because just the economics are so different there. Um, but for international, when you're, when you're valuing your big territories, your big territories always um, Canada, UK, France, Germany, and now that they're buying again, Japan. Um, though there were a few years up until like a year and a half, two years ago, where, I mean, I know when you guys made Splice, uh, Japan wasn't buying at all. Like anything from anybody, if it wasn't Japanese, they weren't buying it. And the director of Splice, I was emailing with Vincenzo one day, and he's like, and this is true, he's like, dude, my, my wife is in distribution in Japan. She's the head of international in a Japanese company. We haven't been able to sell the movie yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and then just on that, and then we uh, we did a very very small movie that Vincenzo executive produced that cost under two million dollars, and we did a huge Japanese sale a year ago. Yeah. <laughs> I think one other trend uh, that started to happen is it's it's English speaking territories. There's there's U.S. distributors who. Um, because the market's sort of contracting, uh, especially for the indie and the home video releases, it becomes more attractive to them if they can get the UK mm. along with uh, North America. I mean, it used to be US and Canada. Now it's North America as one territory. And now the UK is being bundled in there and also Australia. Yeah, well, there's a handful of distributors who have, and I think it's trending this way more, but like Anchor Bay has direct operations in the US, Canada, UK and Australia, Australia, they're all separate offices, but yeah. they, they can buy those and they have their own things all the time. A company like E1 now has operations in, what, seven territories they buy directly yeah. for. Yeah. Um, and IFCs. And in the US too. Yeah. Uh, although E1's never actually managed to pull that together. They have all those territories, but they're really, <laughs> they're all, organized. they're very, very distinct. And uh, like the UK market, for instance, is a very competitive market. It's about to contract a little bit. Um, so they, that territory buys on its own, and they don't really, if it's an independent film, they don't look to the U.S. all that much unless there's already been a pre-buy there. And the U.S., they almost don't seem to care if there's, uh, Americans tend to be arrogant about film. They feel that they know it better than anybody else. And it's, uh, I mean, it's true. They, uh, so it's, uh, I want that on the record. Yeah. Now, it, it, it doesn't hurt to have a film that's done big sales, uh, but they, they, first of all, they know that their market doesn't necessarily care how a film does internationally. Like Tintin was quite an interesting thing, and it was just because it's such a big title in, uh, in France and other, other territories in Europe. And it's like Todd said, they wanted that movie to be seen as a juggernaut before it came to the US because Americans weren't familiar with it. But for an independent film, it's just, it's never gonna be the case. It's, uh, it's very helpful if you can say, well, it won, it can, or something like that for a particular kind of film, but there, it's, it's very, very distinct. We f I mean, we find ourselves in a situation often where we'll acquire foreign language film. And actually, a good, rep a good uh, representation of this is an Italian film. One of our most successful films was I Am Love. did about five million theatrically. It was released traditionally. And I don't think it performed very well in Italy. And you see that kind of constantly. So it helps. I mean, it certainly helps. And it, there is a, a small chance always that it could be the Oscar submission that year. I mean, we're in a situation right now working on a Danish film, Royal Affair, which is also the pick, and we've worked on a Korean film, which is also the Oscar pick, and that definitely helps get it some buzz if, it, if, it, if it's uh, gaining some traction internationally, at least at, at this level, but it's certainly not. I mean, it's, 
it's helpful, but in, in, in a very small way. Yeah. Well, and with Indies of Sales, um, I'll say for sure, um, there are certain companies in certain territories that we are inclined to sell early to um, because they benchmark. Um, and it's and it's in those. If there's really internationally, like there, there are certain companies uh, in UK, France, and to a degree Germany, but really UK, France, that are trendsetters amongst the buyers. Um, and if you can do an early deal, say to an Optimum or a Momentum in the UK, or to Wildside in France, um, for certain types of films, to Madman in the UK, or sorry, in Australia. Um, that benchmarks to the rest of the marketplace and the rest of the buyers in other territories. And it says to people, oh, it's this kind of movie and it's this kind of release. Um, and as a sales agent, there are reasons why you might sell for a little bit cheaper to those people because it's going to have spillover effects in the rest of your sales. Well, and that applies to the financing of the film as well. It's uh, one of the strategies that we use all the time is we try to sell one key territory or sometimes two in advance. And we always sell Canada, but the buyers know that if it's a Canadian film selling in Canada, that doesn't necessarily mean anything at all because we do have a quota system. But if we could then sell to the UK or to Germany or to France, and those are really the three, three big territories that matter, um, and that's exact. Optimum is this company that we always try to sell to first, and if we can, then everyone knows. Oh, okay, so Optimum has a good track record, so it's it's a gatekeeper, as, mm -hmm. as Peter was saying earlier. So on the financing side, when you're putting a movie together, if you can get a, a key territorial sale, that that's really huge. Yeah. Makes everybody feel it's, secure. That's a it's a really good point. I mean, that's the other side of of gatekeeping are those common distributors, because um, these people talk like uh, my acquisitions colleagues. I mean, I see some of my friends at like Optima more than I'll see you know, people in the US even. So there's regular communication. And if I see a film has sold to a place like Optimum or Mad Men or Revolver, Pretty Pictures, like uh, in those key territories, that's where rep that represents to me uh, a film that could potentially work in our market as well. Like we definitely look to those people. Yeah. Should, should we, the, the second question, which I, I'm interested in, which I think probably applies to anybody here that's trying to put co-productions together, is which countries in Europe are good co-producing partners. Mm -hmm. uh, France and Germany, for sure, are the best when it comes to producing a film that is aimed for the North American market, uh, mainly because they have money and, uh, and they're, they're aggressively going out there. Uh, from my experience, more so France. And so that means wherever else you are in, in Europe, you can always co-produce with them. And they always have experience with the North American market, any of the bigger companies there. Yeah. So Belgium has some really interesting yeah. plans right now, too, especially in terms of post-production support. <laughs> um, like they're very, very open, and they make it yeah. as easy as they can. Um, by our standards, easy is still fairly complicated. But there, <laughs> there are definitely some that are easier than others, yeah. And the UK's uh, system's doing pretty well right now, and they also have a new uh, post-production incentive there. Um, and for English-speaking you know, uh, filmmakers, it's you know, a little bit easier to sort of uh, position yourself there. There's obviously an independent filmmaker sector in all three Baltic states, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, as well as the production service sector, which is quite well developed. Um, what is the general awareness of the Baltic region um, of the film industry in the Baltic region, or the Baltic region at all for that matter, back in Canada or North America. Thank you. Um, it's, it's very small, honestly, if, if people are aware of it at all. Um, I'm of the opinion, uh, in the genre panel that Colin and I were on, like uh, Ong Bak came up. Um, and like within Asian cinema, I mean, Thailand had been making films for 100 years before Ong Bak. Um, but before something really makes an impression in North America, you got to get first. You got to get out of the art house, um, and I'm 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 of the belief that for something to really make an impact and for people to take notice, you need two or three things to hit within probably 18 months of each other, and then all of a sudden people go, "Hey, there's something happening there." It's and a renaissance. There, yeah, it's yeah. a trend. Yeah, there, and there may have been something happening there for 50 years before that. <laughs> Um, but until there are a few things in a relatively short span that kind of play in succession, um, nobody notices. 
I mean, not to speak for the industry, but it, I mean, it's it's events like this that will help. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that uh, trend I saw at AFM was <clears throat> the idea of, of taking uh, successful local productions that maybe uh, had a really great concept and trying to set up remakes in the in English language countries, uh, and that can draw attention to to the local industry. Um, and then the third thing would be looking to find, you know, uh, productions that you could maybe bring here and, and draw more attention that way. Um, well, we've actually come up, come to a lot of time. So I, I wanted to thank everyone on this panel uh, for, for contributing. It was, very, it was a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you.